and welcome. I'm so excited about our show tonight. We're in for a treat. With me today is the Education Program Manager from the, the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, Gail Buell is here. She is a naturalist and she has brought with her a peregrine falcon, a great horned owl, and a bald eagle. And I will welcome Gail now and our falcon. Oh, so thank you. Very nice to be Great to, to be see here. you. Um, and this is a peregrine falcon. We call her Artemis. And she is one of our education ambassadors at the Raptor Center. And every bird, you and I were just clarifying this, so I was asking you, every bird at the Raptor Center, Gail, is a bird that has been injured or hurt in some way. Correct. We have our clinic, our hospital, so to speak, takes in injured and orphaned raptors between seven and 800. And actually, we've broken mm. the 800 uh, mark mm. already this year. Um, and so the goal for the clinic is to try to get the birds back out into the wild. Um, the education department, which is what I am part of, uh, we have 33 permanently injured raptors that cannot be released to the wild, but they get to learn a new job. And that new job is being a teacher and going out to classrooms um, across the state as well as going to scout programs and community uh, programs, even county fairs and state fairs, to let people get a beak to nose experience with <laughs> live birds. Beak to nose. Beak to nose to hopefully give them a chance to uh, see what our natural areas are really like and our natural neighbors are and how important they are to our environment. The Raptor Center here is one of the premier Raptor Centers in the world. Yes, it is. And why are, are we given that wonderful distinction? What about this center sets, sets you apart? I, I think when the Raptor Center started in 1974, and we're at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University mm -hmm. of Minnesota, and the two people who co-founded the Raptor Center were very interested, uh, there was a, um, researcher Dr. Gary Duke and then Dr. Um, Pat Reddick. He was a student at the time and mm -hmm. uh, he was a veterinarian and he was a falconer and Dr. Gary Duke was very interested in owl physiology, how owls work on the inside and Dr. Pat Reddick was also interested in that but he was also a falconer so he flew birds like peregrine mm -hmm. falcons uh, for hunting and so they wanted to study um, that so they contacted the Minnesota DNR and said do you have any injured owls that people are calling about that we might be able to study? Well that kind of opened the floodgates, so to speak. And not only did they realize that they could do some studying and really figure this out and how owls really work, but at the same time, they figured out, you know what? We think we can fix some of these injuries we see are coming in. And so that was the germ of how it started. Now, why in Minnesota is we are on the Mississippi Flyway. Mm, we sure. are on one of the migratory pathways, the major migratory pathways for <coughs> many, many birds, including many raptors. So many raptors right now are passing through this area. And a lot of them get into trouble. So we're kind of this, this area where a lot of raptors are. And so that, of course, gave us a lot of opportunity to take care of a lot of raptors learn a lot about raptors. Because we're at a university and we're a teaching institution and always trying to further, trying to learn, trying to figure things out, it's always a process of trying to, how do we fix these birds better? What can we learn from them? And by that, we've pioneered many different techniques um, in the surgical, especially in the surgical arena, on how to fix these birds uh, so we can get them back out into the wild. And not just the surgical, but how to take care of them before and after, um, how to exercise them properly and get them ready to go back So we're wild. just doing those things better and with more birds than other centers. Yes, in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. And because we're a teaching institution, we're international in scope because we do try to attract uh, veterinarians from around the world. I read a, a wonderful quote on your website and it said, every bird admitted provides a clue to the health of the ecosystems we share. That's that a great quote. Isn't that a great quote? Tell us what that means to you. So not just the Raptor Center, but uh, a lot of the university, especially the medical areas, the College of Veterinary Medicine, um, the medical school dentistry is underneath the ac academic health center. And a lot of us have realized over the years that it's not just about livestock. It's not just about humans. And it's not just about wildlife. Mm -hmm. We are all connected. 
Mm -hmm. And how are we connected and how do we influence each other? And all of those things are very, very important. And so that quote is a very important one that you pulled out um, well, because I, that's also what we do. It's I not know, just some fixing of our, the individual birds. Some of our raptors have been endangered because of what we're doing as humans and the pesticide issue, et cetera. Exactly. has been a big problem with peregrine falcons for Oh, exactly. They the are the top of the, top of the food chain predators, right? Humans are top of the food chain predators. So what is going on in the environment is often reflected in what is happening with their populations. DDT, like you mentioned, very, very uh, important turning point um, mm -hmm. in raptor conservation and all types of conservation when we realized that DDT wasn't just out there killing insects like we wanted it to, it was affecting many, many other populations, um, including peregrine falcons, including bald eagles. Um, and their populations dropped tremendously because of the use of that chemical. Um, but even though the, that chemical DDT has been banned since the 1970s, these birds still face a lot of threats. Now, peregrine falcons came off the endangered species list in 1999, mm -hmm. and they are doing very well. And in fact, in Minnesota, our goal was to have 20 pairs of breeding pairs of peregrine falcons in the mm -hmm. state. And that was the goal to get them off the endangered species list in Minnesota. We are over 100 pairs right now. Oh, that's great. It's Just since wonderful 99. News. Yes, it's wonderful. News. The characteristics of what makes a raptor a raptor are fascinating. First of all, the talons. And I, I'm wondering if we can get a close up of these marvelous talons, which are powerful. And obviously, you're protected with the great glove. <laughs> But, yeah. um, and this is how raptors get their name. Um, raptors get their name um, because of their feet and catching their food with their feet. And that's very different than other predatory birds. A bird like a heron or even like a robin are grabbing their food with their beak, where raptors are catching their food with their feet. Um, and so all raptors, um, and we have other feet here Maybe too, and you can touch those. Yeah. One is from a red-tailed hawk and one is from a great horned owl. If you look, the the claws at the end of the toes are called talons, and that's from a red-tailed hawk right there. And they are very, very powerful. And also the toes and the legs they use a lot of tension in power so it's not a lot of muscle power there so uh -huh. they're built very differently than a lot of other uh, species of birds yes, very um, different and then there are other characteristics of course raptors just eat other animals they're not eating anything else they're eating mice they're eating moles and voles and um, and fish and, and rabbits. snakes and lots of rabbits now peregrine falcons are just eating birds that's all they oh, eat. Oh. And in fact, to catch those birds, peregrines do it in a very interesting way because they catch feathers, <laughs> feathers everywhere. They catch the birds in the sky. And I've so they're that. aerial hunters. And because of that, these dive birds, bombers. they're dive bombers. Uh -huh. uh, they're often called bullet hawks. They're not a hawk, they're a falcon. But these birds can dive over 200 miles an hour. They are the fastest animal on Earth. I want to have you repeat that 200 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. In a Fastest dive. Fastest animal on Earth. Yep. The dive is called a stoop, and these birds are incredibly fast. And how long of a distance, how much altitude do they have to have to go that far and that fast? I mean, they often like to hunt at about 1,000 feet in okay. the sky. They can hunt lower for sure, but at 1,000 feet is a pretty good okay. uh, distance for them so that they okay. can they, they can, can catch. really angle the right right, <laughs> right and way. often when they're diving they don't dive straight down they will dive in a circular pattern really? if you've ever put <laughs> oh, <we're laughs> talking. she's she's got something to say oh. oh she's seeing herself on the monitor i think oh. i will try to give her a piece of food see if we can't distract her but these birds um when they dive if you've ever put um uh look at the feathers yeah, you're going to see exactly how these birds eat here. She's oh, going to grab. She eating? She's eating quail today. Oh. And quail is, of course, a bird. Right. And it's one of her favorites. That's a big hunk for it her. It is. And so, uh -huh. what she's doing with her feathers is because she keeps looking into the monitor, is called mantling. So, she's oh. protecting that food oh. from that it's bird. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. It's Look mine. At that. You can't take it away from Wonderful. me. Wonderful. So, um, I'm going to see if I can't get her eating a little bit more with a tinier piece of food she wants. There she goes. Oh, she's going to eat it. So if you've ever put a coin in um, a donation bucket that spins, right. and as the coin goes closer and closer to the middle, it goes faster and faster and faster, 
that's what they use. They use that centrifugal force to help them fly faster. Oh. Another characteristic of raptors, which these birds certainly employ when they are catching their birds, is eyesight. Uh, raptors have excellent, excellent eyesight. And in fact, with diurnal raptors, in particular peregrine falcons, they have two places in their eyes that they can focus. They can focus directly on, just like I'm looking at you, mm -hmm. but they can also focus at a 45 degree angle. So mm -hmm. when they're diving in that circular mm -hmm. pattern. So they see out of the side. Exactly, they can uh -huh. keep their head straight. They're actually not diving with their wings out. Their wings are folded in. Tucked, okay. Um, hence the, the nickname bullet hawk. Um, and so that, that way they can keep their eyes on the prize until the very last moment when they have to slow down anyway. Then they look at their, their prey directly on and then they slow down and grab it with their feet. The, um, the wings and the, the gorgeous pattern here, is that partly for um, hiding from other, I mean, would, would a peregrine be uh, a prey of an eagle? Not necessarily. In fact, I've seen a lot of peregrine falcons chase eagles off and away from their nesting area. Uh -huh. Even though eagles really are not a threat to them, um, they the peregrine looks at the bird as a being a threat and tries to chase them away. Okay. They're pretty formidable, okay. but it is a form of camouflage. It's called countershading, and a lot of predators employ countershading to help them out. And so the bird is lighter underneath mm -hmm. and darker on the back. Just so gorgeous coloring. It is stunning and if I was a bird and I was flying below the peregrine falcon I would look up and the lighter pattern underneath blends in more with the clouds in the sky right, right. and so if, harder to see uh, much harder to see yes and if I was a bird and I'm flying off to the side and I look and she was happened to be flying against something like a cliff and all I could see was her back I actually wouldn't see her back she would blend in with her background there you know speaking of the eyesight I read, and I want to see if this is, is true yet, or if it is a fact, that a, a peregrine falcon could sit at the end of a football field and read the small print in the want ads of a newspaper at the far end of the football field. It's not quite that good, quite I mean, it, but good. it's oh. almost, it's okay. almost. Um, okay. Another way to look at it uh, is if I put her on the top of, um, uh, a light pole, like on a freeway, so you know about how right. high they are. Right. They can be about 40 feet or so. Um, when we are measured for eyesight, we're, we're doing it at 20 feet. That's why right. it's, if they say, it, someone says you have 20, 20 vision, that's what they're talking about. Well, uh, most of the raptors, especially the medium-sized raptors, um, they can do the same as we can at 20 feet at 40 feet. Okay, so, so double what we can. Double. So at the end of the football field for either of us, Correct. right? Okay. But she probably could read you the headlines pretty easily. Mm. So, but not the, not the fine print okay. and not the comics, so. Just because we only have 30 minutes, I'm wondering if we shouldn't say goodbye to Artemis oh, and bring yes, on we should. our While I, owl. Oh, I can't wait, she's been talking back there. Yes, yeah, some of you may hear a sound <laughs> in the background and you're wondering, what is that? It's, this owl. is a skull from a great horned owl, oh, and it that. is definitely showing off the other characteristic of raptors, which is their curved beak. That curved beak that comes to a point is built for biting and tearing and biting and ripping. And uh -huh. so uh, all raptors have that characteristic, um, but that's a skull of a great horned owl. And you can also see on that particular skull how large or where the eyes would be in an oh, owl. Oh, they're huge, aren't they, in proportion to the skull? They're very large. And raptors' eyesight, generally, their eyes are about a third of the size of their skull. So it takes up a lot of space. Now, yes. she's also in this kennel over here. Take me just a moment. So all raptors have a unique beak. They have the talons. They have the eyesight. Oh, here comes our next bird, folks. <laughs> and you said she's been talking because she's hungry? She's hungry. She is also, the reason that she is at the raptor center is that this particular bird is known as an imprint. That means that when she was young, someone found her as a young chick, um, thought that they knew how to take care of her, brought her home, and raised her. And when her eyes opened up and started to clear, instead of seeing great horned owls, she started seeing humans. So she started associating humans with food and shelter and everything else. Now, it doesn't mean, it, this process is called imprinting. 
It doesn't mean that she thinks she's a person or that we're owls, but unfortunately <laughs> she's stuck permanently someplace in between. Mm -hmm. And what that means is she doesn't react toward humans normally and she certainly doesn't react to her own mm -hmm. kind normally. And that causes her to be unreleasable to the wild. Which is unfortunate. So that's the only reason. That's the only that reason. She's, she's mm -hmm. with you. Notice everybody how she turns her head 180 degrees. Right? They actually can turn their head farther than that. Even further. Okay, yeah, and in fact, most she'll... people, and she might as she's looking around here, um, most people will ask me, well, don't owls turn their head all the way around? And my reply is, there's actually no animal that can turn their head all the way around because if they could, it would eventually unscrew and fall on the floor. It does sound painful. Yeah, it's pain, pain, painful. However, oh. owls can turn their heads three quarters of the way around a circle either direction. So 270 oh. degrees to the left, but then they have to bring their head back and then 270 oh. degrees to the right. Okay. And then they have to bring their head back and she's showing off just a little bit there. Now look at her furry talons. Um, or, or feet. Yeah, feet we, and with and the feathers, the, yes. Uh -huh. um, now, great horned owls um, and many owl species have feathers everywhere except for the bottom of their feet, their beak, and their eyeballs. Her eyelids oh. have feathers on them. They do. And, it's, does, and, and her beak doesn't I have any feathers we can too. But see that when we look closely. Oh, really? And these birds are designed for the winter. Now, this bird we would find up in the northern Minnesota winters staying here all yes, winter? Yes, not just in northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, right here in the Twin Cities. And in the Twin Cities. Oh, definitely. Okay. They're very adaptable birds. Um, they don't make their own nests. Um, they take oh. over an old nest from a crow or oh. a red-tailed hawk or something like that. Um, so these birds also nest earlier than any other birds in Minnesota. So they're starting nesting in January and February. And many people will start hearing these really start hooting and calling come December. Ah, and do they only um, come out at night? We think of owls at night. Uh, we do. A lot of people think that owls are just nocturnal, and that's not true. There are some owls that are diurnal or come out during the daytime, and there are some owls, mm. like great horned owls, that are crepuscular. Thank you for letting me say my favorite word. I love that word. Let's say it one more time. Crepuscular. Crepuscular. Great my. word. <laughs> and what it means is dawn and dusk. Ah. So these birds, they oh. can hunt in the middle of the night, but they are most active just as it's getting dark and just as it's getting light. Now, is this the largest of the owls? It depends on what you mean largest. I mean, if you in mean largest by height? height or, or largest or by weight. weight. I'm thinking height. Then no. No. Uh, the largest owl we have in Minnesota by height is the great gray owl, oh. um, which if I had a great gray owl sitting on my hand, we'd be It'd about be that this much high. bigger. Mm -hmm. okay. But the great gray owl does not some... weigh very much. No, and I mean we're talking one pound, two pounds. Two pounds, two to three pounds for a great gray Which owl, is... and a bird like this weighs about. Well, she's weighing in about three pounds. I know that is such a fun fact because we would guess much higher just looking at the the bulk, yes. bulky look. Yeah. Um, we only have ten minutes left, so I think we should. Say goodbye to this beautiful owl and bring on. If you our could give eagle. me just 30 more seconds, of I have course, something I would course. love to show your viewers. Oh, of course. Birds like this, they're they're hunting all different types of animals. These are generalists. They're eating rabbits, they're eating squirrels, they're eating other birds, they're eating mice, they're eating lots of different kinds of animals. But when a bird like this um, is sitting on a, a stump or in a tree, what they're doing is they're not chasing after what they want to catch, they wait. Mm -hmm. So they're stealth hunters. Mm -hmm. When they spot or listen um, and found what they want to catch, they'll start to fly. And owls fly completely silent. And I have a wing here that you can touch oh, here in a minute. Let's look at that. And then when they are reach close enough to catch the animal, they'll reach down with their feet and hopefully catch it. Now, let's say it's a mouse. Okay. In my pouch, I gave the peregrine falcon a piece of quail, right. but in my pouch here I have a whole mouse Ooh. that I would like, do you think she knows what's going I on? I think she's got an idea of something's uh, coming. She does. So in a moment I will go ahead and feed her this mouse. It's is a it dead mouse. Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's dead, but it is a whole mouse. Uh -huh. But it's a very interesting, fun process yes. to watch, and oh. I think she's going to be very cooperative. So here we go. Oh, oh my goodness. And right down the hat. Down the hat. <laughs> down the hat. So, oh my yeah. goodness. You gulp, notice. Gulp, gulp, gulp. Gulp, gulp, gulp. Now, she cannot 
you saw her eat everything, but her body can't quite use all of it. Um, right. So it, tomorrow, she will cough up, or what it's called, casting mm -hmm. a pellet. On the inside of that pellet will be the bones that she cannot digest, and on the outside will be the fur feathers of whatever she ate the day before. Uh -huh. And a lot of students actually um, dissect owl pellets um, in the classroom. To and if you like to be a detective, yeah, uh -huh. it's a wonderful exercise uh, oh, for lots of people. Interesting. So, Thank you for letting me show oh, that, course. and Thank I will be you. right back with the eagle. We'll but this way, the first, the, the first wing is the peregrine falcon. Okay. And then the second wing. Oh, you're wing getting Max, yeah, the eagle. Is the great horned owl. So here we have a falcon, beautiful, beautiful wing with the different, <laughs> different colors. And then this is the owl. Look at this. And to think, Gail, that they are silent and they're this big. It's and can you tell the difference when you feel the peregrine falcon wing versus when you feel the um, yes. uh, the owl wing? Yes. It's it's very different. And uh -huh. so, what is the difference? What do you well, feel? Well, this one's rougher and softer. Softer. This one is smoother and harder. Exactly. The peregrine. And that is the, the owl speed. being able. Uh, the softness of that owl wing allows it to fly silently. Mm -hmm. On the leading edge of that wing, that great horned owl wing is a right wing. On the leading edge, there's also edges. It almost looks like a comb when you hold it up to the light. That also okay. breaks up the air as the birds are flying. Uh, wow. Well, folks, here comes the amazing eagle that I think we're all just in awe of in our country. So, of course, this is our national symbol, uh, the bald eagle. And in Minnesota, we have a nice, healthy population of bald eagles. And, and we, the wing spread is six to eight feet, right? Well, it's actually, most, we see a lot of five foot bald oh, eagles, okay. and then I'm her wingspan is high. about six feet. Okay. Um, and, how and this is a female. How old is she? She is 13 years old, okay. um, but bald eagles don't get their white head or tail, yellow beak or yellow eyes, until they're at least five years old. Oh, she's just gorgeous. Yep. So, so if we saw an eagle flying that was under five, they'd have the dark head, um, and we might even say, is that a hawk? or an eagle. Right, or even a vulture. Some people will mm, confuse it with a vulture. Sure. Um, but often, um, when they're first leaving the nest, they're almost all brown with a little bit of white. The closer they get to five, the more they have white splattered all over their bodies. And then the closer they get to five, ah. between five and six, they'll have more white in their head, more white in their tail, and more yellow in their beak and in their eyes. Now, her beak is so prominent. Yes. I mean, it's more prominent than the other Mm -hmm. other uh, raptors, isn't mm -hmm. it? Is that because she eats things like fish that need more attacking? <laughs> she, <laughs> um, no, I think it's just, you thought Ooh. I had more food, didn't you? She just thought I had another piece of food oh, for her sure. there, and I don't. Well, it's fun um, to see the wings come up. Yes. So the curved beak that comes to a point is a characteristic of raptors. All of them have it, and they're just proportional to the okay. size of the bird. So okay. the bigger the raptor, the bigger the beak. Um, and these birds are fish eaters, and Minnesota is a great place to see bald eagles because we have a lot of water. That's also how they got DDT in their bodies, is that DDT washed off of our farmer's fields into the waters, mm -hmm. got into the fish. They came off the endangered species list in 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, they still face a lot of challenges um, because these birds not only eat fish and waterfowl, they're also scavengers, and they eat a lot of dead deer along the side of our roads. Yes. And during, during the fall season when we have a lot of deer hunters out and they leave gut piles behind after they field dress their deer, um, it's a great source of food for lots of species of animals, including scavengers like bald eagles. Unfortunately, if they're, um, the deer were shot with lead, there's often small fragments of lead mm. in the gut piles. Mm. And this particular bird, um, she was found by the roadside up near Moorhead, Minnesota, 13 years ago. Mm. Um, she has a permanently dislocated elbow on one of her wings, but she also came in with lead poisoning. And mm. we have, we get between 110 and 120 injured and orphaned bald eagles every year in our clinic. 90% of them come in with exposure to lead. 
Mm -hmm. 25 to 30 percent of that 90 percent come in with lead poisoning. Um, mm -hmm. And there are solutions to it, and the easiest solution is using non-toxic ammunition. Mm -hmm. And is that something that our hunting population is being taught or educated about? Uh, there's certainly been a, a big push to try to educate mm -hmm. um, the hunting population that, that uh, and a lot of uh, definitely responsible hunters who like to see bald eagles around um, are certainly looking into it and trying to switch. I read that the nests they, they make can weigh up to a ton, Gail. Oh, they is can. That correct? Yeah, they can. A These ton. birds, part of their courtship ritual is to build on that same nest year after year. Ah. And so the nest every year gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. Oh, so would you like my. another piece? I think she wants another piece. <laughs> is she having quail or what is the No, uh, she's diet having <laughs> She's getting a rat. Oh. <laughs> and uh, that's one of her very favorites. Fish oh. is not her favorite, even though a lot of eagles eat fish and love fish but rat at the Raptor Center is her favorite. So that's what we're giving her tonight. Now, you said she came off the endangered list in 2007. Mm -hmm. How many approximately do we have in Minnesota? Oh right goodness, I know you're gonna ask me that question and I forgot <laughs> to double check my numbers. Uh, the Minnesota DNR um, flies over in the wintertime about every three years to count nests and then do mm. a, an estimation. And if I remember right, we may have to double check my numbers. I think there were 1,300 pairs oh, okay. um, of bald eagles at last count. So okay. um, that's pretty high. We have the highest population of bald eagles in the lower 48. Oh. Um, Wisconsin, we go back and forth with Wisconsin all the time. And then the other state that has a lot of bald eagles is Florida, oh. which is surprising. Alaska, of course, has the most. And then the golden eagle mm -hmm. is primarily found in the west. That's correct. Mm -hmm. We do have a very small wintering population of golden eagles down near Wabasha. And mm -hmm. they've been doing some telemetry studies. And some of those birds um, are summering and, and breeding in Canada. And they're spending their winters with us. Well, this is just fascinating. If you would like to learn more about the Raptor Center or go over and visit their open every day except Monday. Yep. Um, you can check their website. It's www.theraptorcenter.org. Mm -hmm. And um, I know you always are looking for volunteers, mm -hmm. of course, for donations yes. to keep the fabulous program going. And to think that you're going all over the state to do educational things. I mean, what a treat for kids. It is great to, to be able to this. bring these birds into mm -hmm. a classroom. And we do about a thousand programs a year. Well, thank you so much for coming down to, um, to help us uh, learn more about raptors, Gail, and to, to see these gorgeous birds. It's just a wonderful treat. Oh, you're so, very welcome. It was our thank pleasure. You. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week.